Fundamentals of Mixing, lesson number 17. This is functional compression. I'm going to call this part one, and we'll see how many parts it ends up being. Um, but uh, we're going to continue with our SSL channel um, and do the functional compression here. Uh, there are some things that I want you to look out for. So primarily in the dynamic section, uh, we're going to be dealing with a, uh, a fast or slow attack. Okay, so we have two settings. On an SSL, uh, the fast attack is about 3 milliseconds. On slow attack is about 30 milliseconds. Now, when you're working with digital compression, um, the uh, you could type in numbers, and you can start to play with it and go kind of in between. But I wanted to give this um, mix a particular character. So we're going to get those fast attack, slow attack, basic settings, and it's going to be relative to what the transient is. So in other words, a three millisecond attack will have a different effect on a snare drum than it will on a bass, just so you understand. Okay, so there, there is not, there's not an equal equivalency where three milliseconds or 30 milliseconds always does this particular thing. So it is very much instrument dependent. Okay, now um, that said, the VCA compressor has a certain aggressive kind of character and a very radio kind of character, uh, meaning that it translates well. It really allow, gives things an edginess and kind of really makes them kind of cut through. Um, now, with the SSL compressor, we have a release knob. Now, the thing about the UA gear is that uh, it does not show numbers. So like many plugins, even though they, they give you the exact graphic display of what the EQ is, you can actually click on it and type in numbers. And so you can't do that. You do everything by ear. Now, when I work with attack and release times, I'm going to be affecting um, the transient, but also the sustain signal. So if you kind of think of it in the most fundamental way that the attack time is primarily focusing how aggressively it attaches to the transient peak and then um, and then the release time is more or less how you manage the RMS signal. Do you want the RMS signal to sort of snap back uh, quickly, very quickly, or do you want it to uh, sort of sustain and kind of hold that RMS signal a little bit more in place? So one will give you a bit more of a warming character, one will give you a more aggressive um, pumping character. Okay, and so that's something to listen for. Now, there are many things about um, the SSL compression. Normally, when I do a functional compression, if I do it with a digital compressor, I'll use very light ratios because what I want is I want the compressor to respond as much to the transient peak as possible. And if there's any variation in the performance, the lighter ratio, what that will do is it will create a uh, consistency with the amount of gain reduction. And so it'll be a little bit harder to see here because when you look at the gain reduction meter, which exists right here, so you see there's a little line that goes down here to a bracket. This is showing gain reduction, but the first LED is at three. So we're not getting significant amounts of gain reduction. Usually in this process, I'm looking at something in like a one or two dB range in terms of gain reduction. Um, I'm purposefully um, not doing this on a digital compressor, although you can do it, but I'm gonna talk my way through it. I'm, saying purposefully because I don't want to do this uh, twice. And in the process of deciding to use the SSL for this, I would use, in on the analog desk, I would use uh, the SSL board compressors across the desk for my functional compression, or what I'm calling functional compression. I'm going to explain that in a second, uh, what, functional, what I mean by functional compression. Because I can apply it on almost every track across the mix, and it won't be every track, but I can apply it on every track across the mix, and it can help fundamentally enhance and work along with what I've done here on the filtering, okay? And that's important. Now, one of the things that is also important here is that um, in doing this, uh, because everything is on the same thing, when I bypass it, if I bypass it, what's going to end up happening is that it's going to end up... Uh, where I can't separate or isolate out the um, dynamic section from the filtering. So I can't show you what, what is going to happen on either side. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to create, excuse me, a copy of this. Okay, I'm going to create another layer of each one. I'm not going to keep both of them in, but this first one will have only the subtractive EQ that we've done. And then the second one, I uh, would be able to isolate out just the... Um, um, the uh, dynamics right along with it. So all I'm doing here, what you're seeing here, is me just copying all of these plugins uh, all the way across here. And uh, so uh, th unfortunately, there's no shortcut wait for me to do this on every channel all at once. 
And if anybody knows that shortcut, please let me know because it makes demonstrations a lot easier. So um, for, for this perspective, I'm actually going to just take these guys out. You can see here, it's gonna... Uh, luckily, this is not a huge uh, CPU hit on, on the UA uh, interface. Uh, some of them are, are pretty intensely aggressive in terms of the uh, processing power that they take. Um, but uh, I'm running uh, healthy enough uh, processing, or num amount of processors, uh, shark processors. I always love that. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this. I'm going to highlight all these guys uh, just because I, I want you to see this process so it's not, um, you know, uh, I'm not doing anything. So I'm, I'm just taking all those and I'm deactivating them for the time being, and that'll keep everything moving uh, kind of smoothly here. And then uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back here and uh, we're gonna take a look from a top side view. The thing I want I want to um, focus on again, because I did talk about it in earlier lessons, and so this becomes an important thing. What we're talking about is front back energy, okay? And what happens is that, um, what I've talked about before is when you have a particular sound, and I'm just going to create a blob here so that becomes our specific sound, what we're really dealing with is um, the transient energy with the attack time. Okay, so what will happen relative to its position in the mix? So what I've done is I've taken a number of instruments, I've placed them in particular locations, and relative to their original sound, the filtering has either moved them back slightly, moved them up or down, or move them forward based on, so the more full frequency stuff comes forward. Like I didn't do anything with the vocal and it pulled forward when everything was bypassed, right? Or when all, I'm sorry, when everything was in, when all the EQs are in and the filtering was there because it was the most full frequency of everything that was in the mix. And therefore it stands out and pulls forward automatically where things that are filtered down to varying degrees, the more high frequency and low frequency content that's taken away, generally it will move backward. So if I have something here, what I'll do is I'll create a couple of objects and then uh, we'll be able to, I'll be able to kind of move them around one by one. And uh, so I'll give them uh, different colors here so that we can, you know, we could talk about individual things and, um, and deal with it that way. So what I'm gonna do here is I can I can move these all together. I believe I can actually take and so I could take one particular object here and I can move it forward from its position. So now what happens is let's say I've filtered it and I want it kind of in this basic position here. If I have a fast attack, it will help to either hold it in its place or set it back a little bit farther. And then when from that relative position, the release time will do one of two things. A fast release will will the compression will kick in, which will make it dip back a little bit initially, and then it will either snap back into position quickly, pull forward quickly, or when it pulls back, it will or or finds its place there with a faster attack, it'll sustain or hold in its position. So for example, if I have a base, right, and I and I take this base part and I have a fast attack, oops, uh, if I have a fast attack on it, so it sustains in this place and a long release time, it'll, it'll stay kind of stationary, it won't move. Whereas if I had, for example, a snare drum and I want that snare drum to be extra snappy, I may have a slow attack, which allows the transient to push it through, right, pop forward, the compression kicks in, but then it snaps back very quickly. And so what I get is a sharper transient because it's more isolated, a short dip and then it snaps back more quickly. So I get more movement from that particular instrument. So with certain things like guitars and stuff like that, I may want them to kind of pump and move a little bit, create some movement with them. And what that'll do is it'll create some rhythm, all right, that actually kind of moves the instrument and create some grooves. So what happens is if I have an instrument that's pulling forward with a slow attack or another instrument is kind of dipping back a little bit at the same time and then snapping forward, now I have coordinated movement that helps to create layered separation between individual instruments. And so there's some coordination effort that happens here. Now, you think with only having two attack time settings, like this is gonna be very limiting, uh, and it is to some degree, but just to show you how functionally important this is, um, I'm gonna set this up, you know, and we're gonna kind of make it happen. So now I have to decide, how do I want to lay things out in terms of instrumentation, right? Where do I want to place things in the mix, right? And so when we were initially talking about this, one of the things that I would want to have um, forward in the mix and uh, is the kick drum, 
Okay, so as I start with here, I'm going to keep a slow attack time on it. Now, generally, this is something that is a real SSL thing. Like if you if you actually um, find your way to my uh, to the website uh, mpginsider.com, uh, if you're not already there, right? So if you go mpginsider.com, then uh, you'll end up on the website. And uh, so from there, if you look at the power mixing course. I go over the sonic characteristics of individual compressors, and I do this in detail, you know, like to crazy, uh, insane, obsessive, compulsive degree. One of the things I talk about in there is um, uh, in the power compression course and the power mixing course is that the ratio on an SSL seems to be most, um, it, it, it sits usually in a higher range. Okay, so you're gonna see me use it in a variety of different ways, but most of the ratios you're gonna see in the three to eight range, okay? And there's a reason for that. It has a certain sonic characteristic. It will pump and breathe in a certain way there that's better with heavier or lighter ratios. And when I work with digital compression, normally this technique, I would probably use a much lighter ratio, like uh, less than two to one type of ratio. Okay, but I'm going to start with a slow attack. Now, the one other thing that I want to focus on is the release time and working with musical timings. So um, when I focus on this, and the tempo was 120, um, the way that you calculate uh, delay times, if you get a delay time calculator, and there's there's many ways of, uh, of getting to this pretty quickly, uh, there's some websites if you just put in delay time calculator or delay time math, there's some apps that, that do this. Essentially what you get is, um, millisecond values for quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth uh, notes, triplets, etc. So, uh, just very quickly, um, 500 milliseconds is a quarter note, okay, at, at 120 beats per minute. Because at 60 beats per minute, 60 minus or divided by 60 equals one one second. 60 divided by 120 equals 0.5 or uh, 0.5 seconds, which would be 500 milliseconds. Um, and half of that, which would be an eighth note, would be 250. A sixteenth note would be 125. And then as you go down uh, uh, um, from 16th, 32nd note would be uh, 62 and a half. So uh, milliseconds. So when you're kind of working with those particular numbers, it's important to understand where they are. So I'm going to talk my way through this, although you're not going to see specific numbers here. When you look at the release time settings here, what ends up happening is it goes from 100 and you see straight up. So half of the scale is only up to 400 milliseconds because that's where most of the release time work gets done. Then it's like 400 to one second and it goes all the way up to four second release time. Right, so there's a lot going on here, but most of those longer times are not used as often. Okay, so you see more resolution on the release time in the lower area. And you'll notice this with a lot of vintage components. So what I want to do here is I'm going to start and I'm going to focus on the kick drum first, and uh, and so let's just uh, strip back the mix here for a second, and I'm going to focus a little bit now. This particular uh, limiter or compressor also has um, makeup gain built into it, an automatic makeup gain, and it'll almost always uh, give you more than what you want. So, uh, in other words, more makeup. All right, so I'm going to see a little bit of gain reduction here. All right, so you could hear that attack popping through. Now, let's just focus on this a little bit. Okay, so if I Make it a quarter note, which is more or less somewhere around 500 milliseconds. It'll have a certain sound. If I want it to be more aggressive, I'll move it more towards 250. Notice how that low end snaps back faster. If I bring it towards 125, more aggressive. Right, so it, it, and now what I want to do here, I think I'm going to try to stabilize it a little bit. So I'm going to lean more towards 500. Let me just go back the other way. In this particular case, because I want it to actually be uh, to stabilize, I kind of like this ratio of five to one. So let's just see what happens now if I kind of work the claps in here and kind of um, bring this along. And I have to remember here to put my compressor in, so I'll probably screw that up a few times here. Uh, oh, we got a snare.
So I have to decide whether I want this to sit in line with the kick drum, which most of the time I do, right? So I'm going to start there. Most of the time when you when you when I set a certain characteristic for drums, like especially acoustic drums, I'm going to keep that the same. <laughs> Just as I bypass it, they disappear. So I'm going to back up on my output level here just a little bit to make up for So again, all with a slow attack, right? So I want this I want this to be really punchy and tight, right? Very focused. Not normal that you have like make down gain, but you could hear like how that how that kind of pulls everything just really forward there. Right, so it just pulls that that transient through. Okay, so now let me uh, let me kind of focus my settings here onto the tambourine, and I'm going to stay within this realm here of that of that delay time, and let's just see what uh, what happens here. So let me focus uh, forward here uh, as far as the tambourine goes. I think that's going to be in the chorus section. Oh, here, well, here I can see it here. There's also a very musical aspect to uh, to this um, SSL at 30 milliseconds. There's something about it that is very. Um, uh, it has like a it's, it's a slow enough attack that it allows some warmth in the transient where it's not too uh, too tight. Uh, where on the three millisecond side, it'll have a tendency to uh, pull a little bit more on the on the transient and sometimes that if the ch transient initial transient is very sharp it'll kind of cut through in a more poking kind of way that can be kind of hurtful or annoying maybe is a better word not hurtful okay uh so uh so this guy is uh there i right, just so want to make sure i'm using the right one all right so this is the rim shot All right, so that stick is kind of coupled in there. All right, so now I'm going I'm to take a look at the bass here before I'm moving on to some of their instrumentation. I'm going to start with a fast attack here and then a longer release, more like a, a second. Uh, helps when I put the compressor in. So the bass is the first victim, or the first one to make me a victim or to catch me in the right handed. All right, so it's going to keep the bass a little more solidly placed. And then we'll hear this relative to the to the rest of the uh
that snare is really annoying sounding. I'd have to work on that. So notice the way the kick drum pushes through the kick, right? And that's part of also the fast attack on the bass and the slow attack on the kick. It allows that transient to just push right through the bass. Um, and the bass kind of stays a little bit more like an anchor in the mix. And there's a couple of ways to kind of level that out, but that's this is one way. This is very much like an LA-2A style approach where we're actually with a faster attack on that, be closer to a millisecond attack and a program dependent release. So it's that's why it's that's such a great match like on a bass. And we're gonna end up putting one of those on later because that's uh, just like a perfect thing. So let's go to the hi-hats. So let's just see here. We got, so just getting, so I'm getting all these guys coordinated together with the same release time. So some people will say, well, do you want to make that uh, like a different, like a faster release time because it's quicker or, you know, or would you do that? But I want, I want all of these instruments to be tied together, to be linked together. So in other words, if I want this all to attach to each other groove wise, and I want to keep similar settings, um, that will keep them kind of moving in coordination. If that makes sense. All right, so let's go over to the loop because this is obviously also a very big part of what's going on here. Click my mute switch, then opens everything other up. And so what I'm going to do on, let me see. All right, let me go back here because we have like these two guys on the chorus section. And uh, so let me just uh, see if I can coordinate these guys in with similar settings. So I want to see that kind of breathing all together. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow the transient to be aggressive and cutting, but it's going to it's going to keep it more or less stable. And uh, I'm going to do this guy as well with the same settings. Uh, let me go back to the chorus section. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Now I may end up kind of going in a little bit more aggressively with some, or I may end up switching to a fast attack on the drums. We'll kind of see. And then I also have like some things like the reverse snare. And uh, yeah, I'm going to do a similar kind of thing here with it. Even though it's inverted, again, just it's just like a it it's like a coordinated effort to make sure that everything is operating on that same uh, fundamental uh, level here. So I think we've got everything. I don't think I did the stick. So let's take a look at what the stick has done here. Also have to remember to pull these guys down a couple dB to make up for the missing game. <laughs> so even pulling down the gain, it's still like there's still a lot of extra level here. Uh, let's see. So we got the crash. Um, again, this this may sound uh, a little bit crazy, but it uh, there is something here. All right, there we go. There's the guy I was looking for. All right, let's see. So part of what makes these guys so dynamic is it's the movement here, right? I'm, I'm allowing the transient to cut through better. And I'm also creating some clarity in there. So now let's move on just to uh, uh, continue some of this. We got some other things here with like the kick build and uh, some of this stuff, but I'm going to skip over for the time being right on to guitars and let's just uh let's uh deal with guitars and we'll come back and we'll deal with the effects so let's just see uh what we can coordinate on this end see if we can get this with the guitars and maybe call that part one so let's just see here um... so with the guitars i'm also going to have a fast attack here but i'm going to work with a faster release time Especially with these two guys. So more of like a, a 250 release time. So the faster release will give me a little more movement. And that'll create that, you know, that that outside uh, movement that I'm looking for. Now what I'm going to do, you know, that that rhythmic kind of pulsing, right? It'll be faster and that'll be more appropriate based on on what's going on. So let's move over to where the guitars, those are the rhythm guitars come in. I'll move to a later section over here. So what I'm going to go with here is a fast attack. Let me actually, because uh, I'm not sure what windows are what here. So let me just shut everything down. All right, so these are my two guitars over here. Oops. So I'll start with a faster attack on these guys. 
because I want these guys to sit back a little bit more. And maybe what I'll do is I'll make the release times with the fast attack because they're smoother sounds overall. Sit in. All right, so let's just see. Unfortunately, I gotta, I gotta slide these guys over. I was trying to make it so I could display all of these guys too at the same time. So notice the separation here. Like, notice how like there's a depth difference. The faster attack moves those other rhythms back a little farther, and then the slower release time sort of stabilizes them, whereas the funky guitar is pulled forward. Where here, they're on the same plane, relatively. Right? Notice that openness. So now as we add that in to the rest of the rhythm section... Of course, this is along with the subtractive EQ. All right, so now if I, uh, let's see if I can uh, set this up as promised here. So now if I have um, uh, this guy added in, so, um, so this uh, first example will be uh, just with filters. Now notice how the front back field uh, changes when I add in the compression along with the filters. There's still some added gain stuff going on here. Part of that is really the movement. So it's it's another layer of separation that I'm bringing in here. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna call this uh, part one of the functional compression and then we'll uh, wrap up the rest of the functional compression in uh, part two. Um, and uh, that'll include the rest of the instrumentation, not a whole lot uh, more, with, but with the effects, uh, and uh, maybe we'll bring in the vocals and uh, also uh, the keyboards all along this, and that should balance everything out.